I'm Dr. Nisli Chiopinis. Tonight I have the chance to talk to you about a topic that's personally very interesting to me, and that is about children with ADHD and their social relationships. Um, one of the things historically with ADHD is the focus has not been on social relationships. It's re really been focused much more on school. How do we get them through homework? How do we get them to follow routines and do things at home? And this area of social, of how to helping them succeed socially, although parents have mentioned it to me for years, um, it's, we're only now beginning to get some research data. In fact, as of last fall, for the first time, social interventions were mentioned as a research-based intervention, working with parents to help their child succeed socially. So I can stand up here and say now things much more confidently than I could have even six months ago. So our goal today is to um, work with helping our kids do good socially. Um, I have a disclosure, and that is, that is just that part of my work is supported by funds to CHOP for um, continuing ed, parent education. That's not this program, but to let you know about that. So the overview, I want to start out with how does ADHD affect peer relationships? How, and in particular, we want to focus on it across the lifespan. Um, up through adolescence at least. I'm going to focus more on younger children today because we are going to have a workshop on adolescence in September where we will focus solely on adolescence, but I am going to obviously talk about applic applications for adolescence today as well. And then what can we do about it? So I don't want to just talk about what happens, but how can we help our kids? How can we help them succeed with their social skills? How can we help them make friends? What's your role as parents? And how, how can the teacher help as well? And then lastly, just any time we talk about social interactions, we want to think about bullying and keeping kids from being bullied and also keeping our kids from being the bully. Sometimes out of impulsivity and not being mean, kids can get caught in that as well. Real quick, for those of you who haven't been a part of the workshops before or who may be newer to what ADHD is, what is ADHD? It's a neurodevelopmental disorder. That means it's a difference in how the brain is wired that shows itself differently across development and that has three main facets, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. The, the core ADHD has three main subtypes, um, which in the newest version of the diagnostic manual are listed as presentations. Um, it has what we used to call ADD, is the inattentive presentation. It also has children who primarily only have hyperactive impulsive symptoms. That's really only present in preschool. Um, once children start school age, they develop more um, inattention symptoms. And then children, most commonly children with the combined presentation, who have both hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. This chart is commonly used to talk about ADHD and the impact of the different subtypes. And in fact, you saw it at an earlier workshop for those of you who have been to multiple workshops. What's, what's new here is I've added in the social piece. Um, typically what we think about is the inattention symptoms of ADHD are really the ones that exert the impact academically. So when we're looking at academic impairments, it's the inattentive subtype and the combined subtype kids who have difficulty with that. When we're talking about more behavioral impairments, difficulty sitting still, getting in trouble for getting up out of their seat, that's more the hyperactivity impulsivity symptoms. So that's there in the hyperactive impulsive presentation and the combined type. What's really important about the talk tonight is that the social impairments are in all three subtypes. That unfortunately there's not one subtype that doesn't, um, that doesn't have social impairments. Before we get to the impact of ADHD on social interactions, I want to think about what social interactions in general. What is social competence? Um, so how can we, as human beings, exist in a social world in a way that, that is, leads to mutually reciprocal relationships? It's a pretty complex term, but basically it's how do we integrate what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we're behaving to achieve goals, and then to achieve outcomes that are, happen within a given context. Um, and a given culture. Just that definition alone should tell us ADHD, should, really, this is a tough thing to do. And if you think about a child who has difficulty stopping their impulses to think about their actions, difficulty multitasking and bringing things together, um, it's no surprise that kids with ADHD have difficulty with this. The social arena is a very complex world. 
Um, and the reason it's been neglected with ADHD is not that it's not an impairment with ADHD, but really because it's a harder place to intervene. It's harder to do something with because it's so complex. So when we're looking at being socially competent, um, what are the different elements of this? You can see two of these elements are very directly related to ADHD. The self-regulation, which really that should be impulsivity and hyperactivity. Um, so the difficulty regulating that emotion. And then planning, organizing, decision making, that's the executive function deficits that are associated with the inattention symptoms of ADHD. One of the big challenges when we're trying to help kids succeed socially is you can see another big piece of social competence is a positive self-identity. So how do we help them get that awareness that they need to succeed and to, to improve what they're doing while helping them really feel good about themselves? Um, and that's, we'll come back to that theme as we go on. The other important pieces of it, there's not been much research on social interactions that look at differences among cultures. But cultural competence is a huge piece. And cultural expectations for kids vary greatly. Um, a culture where kids really aren't expected as much to spend a lot of time sitting in a school setting are going to have a much higher tolerance for hyperactivity and impulsivity. Um, likewise, a culture that really expects kids not to question adults, not to speak up, might have a much lower tolerance for hyperactivity and impulsivity. Inattention, um, as far as the ability to follow through with commands, is, is something that intrinsically seems a little bit less culturally laden, but we don't have that research to tell us that for sure. Also, when we're thinking about social interactions, we want to think about what's the process of a social interaction. So if we think about a child who wants to join a game of ball, a, a pretty easy, relatively straightforward young child social situation. Two kids are playing ball. The third one wants to join in. If we think about a child with ADHD doing that, well, they come up and they see somebody kicking ball. And what they do is say, can I join? Well, at that moment, they have to notice the other kid's reaction. So let's say the other two kids sort of look at each other, roll their eyes, give sort of nonverbals that they don't want somebody else to join, which is common in early elementary school and not necessarily particular to the child. But the child with ADHD at that moment is looking at the ball and running eagerly to go kick the ball and misses seeing that. They, they've missed that ability to respond appropriately before you even started. That speaks to the role of attention. Then, then you can think about, OK, well, once I've noticed it, let's say I noticed it, but I don't know or I don't completely understand what them looking at each other is. Um, or I might interpret it more negatively. I might interpret it or more positively, because I'm so eager to join. I'm going to interpret it as, oh, they didn't say no, so that must mean I can join. Um, so they can, they can err there. And then these last two pieces, you can see how impulsivity potentially could interfere be and, and inattention. How do I come up with different possible things I could do? So if they look like they don't want me to join in playing ball, what's my next step? Do I just walk away? Do I jump in and grab the ball and try to join anyway? Um, or is there a third option? And that, that ability to stop and think about your action before choosing it is an important part of the social information processing mod model and a lot of social interactions. And that's hard for kids with ADHD. And we'll, we'll talk about some ways to help them with that. But that, that's one of the pieces that particularly for young kids with ADHD is particularly hard. So what, what do we find um, for kids with ADHD? A lot of the research so far has focused on what we can see most easily in social interactions. And that is more the hyperactivity and impulsivity. Um, in noticing that kids with ADHD are more likely to want to speak up out of their enthusiasm, that at that moment they want that interaction to go the way, the way they want it to go, or they want to play this. Um, part of what I love about kids with ADHD, that excitement of the moment. But in that moment, speaking of that excitement in a way that, that isn't always helping them socially because it makes them bossy. Um, they may tend also out of that excitement to monopol monopolize the conversation. Um, and if they're not sure how to problem solve or come up with a way to resolve a negative reaction, they may respond more hostily because like, they feel rejected. So they're going to push back. A lot of research is focused on that. But now as we look more, we're finding that not only is hyperactivity and impulsivity linked to social deficits, but inattention independently creates its own social deficits. Um, 
kids who have the hyperactivity and impulsivity, they have a greater risk of being rejected, of being more bossy and doing things that make them rejected. But kids who are inattentive are much more likely to just be forgotten, to be neglected, not to take that time and effort to initiate and plan a social interaction. Um, in a chat room task, they're just more likely to talk less. They, they have difficulty coming up with what they need to say. Um, and when they do talk, sometimes the conversation has moved on so much that they make more off-topic conversations, and it's harder to remember the interaction. This is particularly important because if we think of what happens as children get older, I mentioned ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition. As kids get older, hyperactivity goes down. The inattentive kids from early on up, um, Inattention is, continues to be their, their challenge. For those combined kids in early elementary school, what happens over time is the hyperactivity goes down until the predominant issue as you get into middle school and high school really is more that inattention. Kids may be a bit impulsive. They may um, tend to speak and be too talkative. But the biggest issue socially is that how complex social interactions are, being able to remember the details of it, and being able to to navigate a lot of social interaction is saying, well, it's OK that I don't know what's, I don't know that I don't get what I want right now, but it's OK because I'm going to wait. And if I do this for you, in a day or two, it's going to make you a better friend and you'll do something for me in the future. That's a hard concept for kids with ADHD to get. Um, so, big focus when we get into adolescence, for those of you with older kids, is, is getting at more of the social comprehension, social problem solving. What do I do when things don't work out? So not just joining, but what happens when I'm already in an interaction and we have conflict? They've looked at, they have looked at gender, and up to now they, don't, they find that girls and boys aren't that different socially in terms of what the difficulty is, except that we do have to consider norms. So a girl who's active is going to be more likely to be rejected by peers at a lower level of activity than a boy who's active, because um, activity is a higher, um, just higher base rate for boys. So anytime we're trying to help kids with ADHD, um, for those of you who have been to other workshops, you've seen this before. For those of you who haven't, I want to go through these key concepts, because these are really important um, for intervening. Um, the big, a big issue with kids with ADHD is not that they don't know what to do. And this is often really confusing for parents, because you'll have a conversation with them, and it'll seem like they get it. They'll be able to tell you, yeah, I should have done that. Um, and then they leave head to school, fully prepared, you think, to have to do it differently today, and they forget. Um, and the, halfway down the hall, they forget that conversation. We talk about that as a skill versus a performance deficit. A child who has an autism spectrum disorder also has social deficits. There, the social deficits more are, I don't understand social relationships. I, I respond differently to it. With ADHD, kids get it at least as much as they've learned it. All kids over development are learning, are learning social interactions. Um, so they, they need to learn skills. But kids with ADHD are capable of learning it. They may be a little behind other kids in their learning, but they know what to do. The difficulty is, how do I do it when I'm excited, when I'm in an environment that has all sorts of different things going on? How do I process all of that and do what I know I should do? So we talk about can't versus won't consistently do. Um, and, and, and that also speaks to the other issue we talk about. The most consistent thing with ADHD is the inconsistency. It's one of the things, for those of you as parents, that I know is the most wearing thing. It's great that one day they, it all comes together. But when you go and you say, I don't even know why today was different, and you're trying to figure that out, it can be really wearing to know that. And it's, what teenagers with ADHD and middle schoolers, when they're able to voice that, will say often is, is the difficult thing. Like, I wish I could do it every day. I don't know why it came together that day and it didn't. And that's particularly an issue um, socially. Second point is we have to apply treatment at the point of performance. So that's related to this can't voice versus won't. If I meet one-on-one -on -one with a child with ADHD, I can meet with them. They can have great understanding. We can use all sorts of strategies, just like you do when you talk with them. They leave my office, and I guarantee within an hour or two, they've forgotten the majority of what we've talked about. 
Um, so as a result, the issue is what we need is to have them know and have that intervention where they need it, when they're out with peers, when they're in recess, when they are in the playground, when they're interacting with friends. And that's particularly a challenge here with social interactions, but we'll talk about some ways to do that. Um, it, one of the ways to do that is getting you guys involved. Um, and that's, that's the intervention that's been shown to work socially. Get parents to help their kids. And there's, there's also some evidence for how we can get teachers involved too, and I want to talk to you all about that so you can get your child's teacher involved in doing that. But predominantly because you all, I know, are less in the social interaction, particularly for those of you with older kids, um, than you are in some other things like doing homework, getting them to clean their room. Nonetheless, you're more in their real world setting than anyone else. So what we need to do is, is use that to try to help that. Um, and then other times, not just parents, um, as they get into high school and maybe as a parent you're not as cool, um, maybe a coach could be a substitute or some other, you know, sometimes an aunt or a special neighbor friend or something is that person that has that special connection that could be doing some of this. And then the last thing is that we always need to think about how do we get any improvements to continue. Um, that's what we mean when we talk about generalization and maintenance. So basically, when we teach kids with ADHD to do something, let's say I want somebody to learn to let their friend choose what to do first, or I want them to learn to use, for those of you with older kids, active listening in a conversation to restate somebody else's what they said before you go on and talk about what you have. Um, one learning thing is learning to do it. So learning that skill to begin with. But then the process is I have to recognize any other time this situation comes up that here's a time that would work. This, this is a situation where, oh yeah, that active listening might help here with this friend, or it might help here with this teacher, or it might help in this situation. Or, um, and so, and that process is particularly difficult for kids with ADHD. In fact, one researcher, Howard Abakov at NYU, argues that that's really a core deficit of ADHD, that difficulty generalizing what you learn in one setting to another setting. So whenever we intervene, we have to make sure that we're really thinking about that. Otherwise, we're only affecting them in one setting. And they may be learning, well, when I'm in recess and they're playing dodgeball, this is what I do. But if I go out to recess and suddenly everybody's playing tag, I don't know what to do. Or if it's indoor recess, I'm not sure how to translate that. So what we want to do is, is really plan in what we do for how, how to um, help them with that process. And then we also want to plan for how to keep things going good. We know that these kind of interventions that we talk about, what, what we've talked about with parent, at home, at school, with executive function and now peers, we know they can help kids, but we also know that what tends to happen is when parents come, learn the strategies, we're working with them, kids do better, and then it's hard to maintain. It's hard to keep kids doing better um, when we stop meeting. Um, so we really want to plan for how do we keep that going as, as you move on through life. And then the other piece that's a theme for ADHD, because ADHD is a neurobiological condition, is that medication often can be very helpful. Um, and it does make a difference for kids socially, but it doesn't normalize kids socially. So medication alone is not sufficient um, with social interactions. And a big piece of that is medication doesn't teach skills. So medication may help a child who's extremely active or impulsive slow down enough and think before they suddenly grab the, another child's toy. Um, it, it may help them manage some of that multiple um, complexity of a social interaction and notice more cues. It may help with the inattention that way. But if they haven't learned problem solving, or they haven't learned that justice in relationships means that I do it now, then you take a turn, then, then medication won't make them do what they haven't learned, and we need to teach those skills. So what are the challenges? Um, I've alluded to these before. Um, one big one is just the fact that it, socially we have less control as adults. Now the encouraging thing is parents can make a big difference. And I'm going to show you, um, talk, talk to you about that. Um, but, but it's a difficult thing because when we intervene, we need to always be cautious that we're not changing the interaction too much 
and not making the child be seen negative um, because we came in and intervened in the middle of a social interaction, um, particularly for older kids. Um, it's also more difficult to intervene at the point of performance, like I mentioned already. Um, so sometimes our role might be helping a coach know how they can help a child, or helping a drama teacher, or um, helping a favorite teacher who happens to be out on the playground know how they can help the child. And then the social interaction just is, is it's the most complex interaction kids with ADHD have to do, so it really gives it an issue for generalization. So what can we do about it? That those are the challenges. Thankfully, we can do something about it. It's not that we can't. Um, I want to begin, there's sort of two pieces of it. One is how do we help kids improve their social skills? So when we're watching our child, and, and this is very individualized, there's social skills deficits that are specific, um, that reoccur commonly with ADHD, but just as there are commonalities, there's differences. And I, if I went around this room and asked where your child has difficulty socially, we'd get some familiar themes, but we'd also get a lot of differences. Um, so when we're thinking about how to help, I want you to think about those areas where your child has particular difficulty. And so we want to think about what do we want them to learn to do. Um, I'm going to talk later then about how do we help them form friendships and what your role is. So one thing, what, what do we know so far? One thing we know is that unfortunately those social skills interventions that tend to be like eight sessions where you go to a social skills group, for kids with ADHD it's not enough. If, if they have skills deficits, it may be something that will help them learn in that situation, but the difficulty generalizing to the real world, it, doesn't sh really, it hasn't been shown to add um, to medication as an ability to generalize. Likewise, if I'm sitting and I'm helping my own individual child learn a new skill, let's role play, let's practice. Um, let's think about, you know, when that child comes up to you and asks if you want to play, how do you respond? Or when you ask to play and they say no, how do you respond? And I'm tr working at home on teaching them. That's a good first step. If a child doesn't know how to do that, it, then, then they need that. But it's not enough because it doesn't mean that they're going to, when they're at lunch, when they're at recess, when they're playing sports, remember what you talked about. So we need to definitely include strategies to help them with that, to help them remember, oh yeah, that's right, we talked about that, this is a situation where we need to do it. So the steps, um, begin with teaching the skill. It's not enough, but we have to start there. We want to set them up for success. So if we're going to set them up for success, we have to make sure that they know um, what we want them to do. So just as I'm not going to want a child to sit down um, and pay, I, I'm not going to pay a child to do homework or reward them for doing homework if they don't understand their homework. I want to make sure they understand it first. Um, or I don't want to get upset at a child for cleaning their room if they really don't know where things go or what to do. I want to make sure that they know what they need to do socially. So I want to teach them that new skill. But that alone's not enough. So then we have to think about how can they apply it? When can they apply it? And really intentionally create a plan. And with that plan, how can I, as a parent, remind you to do it? For older kids, sometimes a smartphone text message, something like that can be a great reminder. It can be a way you insert yourself in a way that's sort of socially appropriate um, that, that other kids don't know about. For younger kids, you may be able to come up with some sort of hand signal or something that, you know, pointing to my eyes to remind them to look, or something to give them a prompt so that you can remind them. And then what we want to always include, um, and you'll see this as a theme with ADHD, is they are working extra hard to do all of these things we're asking them to do. So just as most of us would not go to work without a paycheck, um, most kids with ADHD need that extra incentive to push through the boredom of doing these things and, and succeed in doing it. So paycheck doesn't need to be money. It may be extra time at a, extra screen time, get to stay up a little later, extra time with a parent, chance for those of you with teenagers, privileges, you can have the use of the car, you can come in later on the weekend. Um, there can, there's a lot of logical consequences that can be those incentives, but they, it's important to have them paired with skills use or else kids with ADHD are going to forget to use it. And, and what we see that happen neurologically. When we look at neuroimaging studies of kids with ADHD and kids without ADHD, if they are doing something they're interested in 
And their brains work just like the brains of kids without ADHD. And if they're doing something that's boring, but we give them a reward for doing the boring thing, again, their brains work just like the brains of kids with ADHD. We can't see a difference. Where we see the difference are the two situations that come up socially, when they're doing something boring or when they're emotionally worked up. They're excited, they're anxious, they're angry. Those are where we find the differences. But so if we can keep them motivated and just motivated enough, that's when they're going to have full access to all that great brain. And just like they can use it to, for many kids, play video games and multitask with the best of them, um, they can, we can hopefully get them to be able to do that in the real world too. So for those of you who work with how do we intervene at home, how do we intervene at school, um, this, process, this concept of social learning theory is probably not new to you. Um, in essence, what social learning theory is telling us, it's telling us that we can change kids' behavior by changing what happens around the behavior. If what I just do is focus on changing a child's behavior, what I end up doing is getting in an argument with a six-year-old or a 12-year-old. Or, um, and, and also what I end up doing socially is making them feel really bad. Um, what we end up getting caught doing is just telling them, oh, you didn't do that or you need to go do that. And that can really tie kids up a knot socially because they're trying to gain that confidence. They're trying to learn it. And if what we're doing is just pushing them in to change the behavior, they're not learning it naturally. So if instead what social learning theory tells us is we can take a step back and we can think about the antecedents, so what happens before a behavior, and the consequence, what happens afterward that changes the rate of what the behavior does. So if we ap apply this socially, what we want to think about is what social skill do you want your child to show? This takes an extra step on your part. A lot of times parents can say very quickly what they don't want their child to do. Those times in the social interaction where they wince and they feel like, oh, I wish you hadn't done that. Um, what we want to do is take that extra step and tell them what, it, what is it we want them to do. So for the child that's not paying attention to other people's personal space, give them their space bubble. So give, give a space around themselves. For the child that's being more bossy and wanting to do what they want to do, maybe they can let their friend choose an activity. For the child who's getting really frustrated about things and angry and having more meltdowns using your words when frustrated. Um, so what we want to do is, and, and this is a really important piece, if we can't say what we want them to do, we can't teach them what we want them to do. Um, and if you think about being at work and having your boss say, I don't want you to do this, but not telling you what they want you to do, that's a pretty frustrating situation to be in. Um, and we want to be careful that we don't put kids in that situation. So again, what we want to do is start by teaching that behavior. So if they don't already know it, teach them. Expli begin by explaining. Explaining alone is not enough. And we want to be very careful, because kids with ADHD, we can lose in words very quickly. A lot of times, we will think that they're not getting it, so we'll talk more, and they'll tune out. So what we want to do is explain it, and explain in fewer words, and then start helping them see it. Um, showing them videos of other kids doing it can be a way to show it. Even better, maybe they were successful in doing it once, and we caught it on a video, and we can show them, look, you did it, um, great. Or, or role playing, okay, let's practice. I'm gonna be Tommy when he comes over for the play date, and um, I want to do this, and you, how would you respond? And let's practice that. Initially, we probably have to model the skill because they might not know what we're teaching them, but then eventually we want them to be the one doing it. And even though that kind of practice is not enough, we wanna make sure they do it before we set them free in the social world. One of the difficult things um, in parenting a child with ADHD is some of these things, they can get it, but it's more effortful. Um, so for you as parents, um, you know, I often hear parents say, you know, I'm just exhausted. It's, it's some, I love my child, but sometimes I feel like this isn't what I signed up to do. It's a lot of work. Um, unfortunately, it is a lot of work up front. The good thing is if we do do that, we can help them do better. Um, the other thing that might be an adjunct there is for some kids who have had difficulty socially, they've already been rejected, they already feel like they're not doing well, we may also have to teach them to challenge those thoughts. Many kids 
with ADHD will just use their ability to distract themselves and say, oh, I don't care, I just want to do computer games. And we miss the fact that they actually really do care about having friends because they don't want to st say, well, I care about it, but I, I'm not successful. Um, so instead they think about things they feel good about and we may need to teach them to handle those thoughts and to challenge it and see themselves as good socially. So this is a list of just possible behaviors based on things that happen for kids with ADHD that we might want to teach. For younger kids, sharing, letting a friend choose the activity, taking turns. Um, for older kids, let's start doing active listening because one of the things we know is it's really hard for them to understand the details of a conversation. And if they say it out loud, that's going to help their long-term learning. So it's going to help them be more likely to know the details. How do I express my wants calmly? Um, that can often be a dilemma for kids with ADHD where they feel like either they get frustrated because they and try to force their wants on somebody else or they give up. And, and how do I navigate that where sometimes I get what I want and sometimes you get what you want? How do I stay calm even if we um, don't agree, even if I lost? Um, how do I express my feelings? How do I stop? When a friend says stop, this is something that's often problematic for kids with ADHD. Often kids with ADHD are the one in the classroom that gets in trouble, not because they were the only one misbehaving, but because everybody else saw the teacher coming, stopped, and got quiet, and the child with ADHD is the one who's still continuing to, to do the thing, and then they get in trouble. So once we know what behavior we want to work with, um, then what we want to do, what social learning theory tells us we can do, is we can step back from that behavior and change what happens before and what happens afterward to help your child be successful. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how do we change what happens before. So the key thing with antecedents, antecedents is like handicapping in a sport. It doesn't guarantee success, but what it does is make it easier to be successful. It, you're setting your child up for success. It doesn't directly change the, relate, the rate of how often a child responds to something. So when we talk about using antecedent interventions socially, what we're thinking about is how do we help set them up for success? And this may be doing more planning, and it often means doing more planning in advance of social interactions. Um, so if, if we notice patterns that in cer certain situations our child has difficulty, um, maybe it's when we say something, maybe it's around certain kids. For some kids, they do great one-on-one, -on -one and they have great difficulty in a larger group. Um, that's often the case for kids who are inattentive. For other kids, they may do great in a group, but have greater difficulty with the complexity of that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, if we find those situations that are likely to be difficult, what we want to do is set them up to begin with to be successful. This is easier with younger kids where we have more control over what happens, but even with our older kids, we can make suggestions that way. So instead of planning a sleepover play date that lasts most of the day for a child who has difficulty making it through the first hour sharing, plan an hour play date. Um, plan and act and deliberately in advance plan how to set it up activity wise for them to be likely to be successful. So um, an older child a middle school or, teen or high school student who maybe has difficulty knowing what to do and gets bored when you do things at home. Maybe what you do is you offer to take them for an outing someplace and think about it as being something where your child's likely to be successful. They will enjoy it and they're likely to feel positive about it because again you're setting them up for success. And it never hurts um, to, for a child to be associated with positive things too. That also can really help with the other kids. Oh, when I go to Tammy's house we always do something fun. I want to go to Tammy's house. So doing that uh, extra effort of setting them up with something fun. Um, so, so when we're talking about antecedents, we're talking about setting events. That's, that's some of what I've just mentioned right here. Another piece with setting events can be siblings. Um, often, if siblings are um, better socially at navigating it, uh, navigating the social environment, particularly if they're older, because in general kids tend to be drawn toward older kids. Um, if that's the case, um, then having a sibling around might be setting a child up not to, not to do as well. Um, so what we may need to do is suggest that that sibling goes somewhere else and does something else so the child can have a chance to be alone with a friend and it doesn't seem like their sister or their brother always steals their friend. Um, and, then, and then in the setting, coming up with 
direct ways to influence. So, so if things look like they're getting boring or they're going difficult, how can you intervene in that situation um, to help it out? Um, some of that you may be able to do directly. You know, you notice you're monitoring, trying not to look like you're hovering too much and getting in it too much, but, but monitoring what's happening um, and noticing oh, things aren't going quite as well. Um, sometimes those, those video things we use for infants can work really well for this because we can be in a room without being there, but we notice things are getting more difficult and just seem to spontaneously come in and say, hey, why don't we all go to the park? Or why don't we, something that seems to be unrelated to the child, but you're bailing them out. You're helping them do something positive. Um, also, um, jumping in and, and modeling. But again, we want to be careful with this because we don't want to look like we're jumping in and pointing out what our child did wrong. So we don't want to, when they were just insisting um, what the, that they wanted to do something, jump in and say, why don't you let Joey choose? Because what that does, unfortunately, is make it look like a child, point out that the child didn't just ask that. But if we recognize, OK, wait, it, they're looking like they're getting bored. They're going to have to move on. Well, then we can jump in and go, hey, what, do you, what, what would you like to do now, Joey, before, the, before we're undercutting the child, jumping in sooner? So the antecedents are just designed to set them up for success. They don't ensure it. Um, and that gets us to the consequence intervention. Um, there's two types of consequence intervention. There's reinforcement and there's punishment interventions. Um, the reinforcement interventions we're going to talk about first, their goal is to increase desired behavior. And this is the main intervention we want to use when we're helping kids socially. Um, because what we want to do is teach them to do something that they're not doing currently and that doesn't come naturally to them. Um, so just as um, when our employer says, what I want you to do is increase productivity by this amount, and if you do, it'll be linked with a bonus next year or something like that, and that's going to set you up for success. We want to set our kids up for success. We want to think about what is it behaviorally we want to increase and how can we help them with that. So what we want to do is say, what behavior do we want them to show more of? So this comes back to those behaviors we've already defined, and um, how do we get them to increase that frequency? We, can, we do it by associating it to what we call positive reinforcers. There are primary reinforcers. We call them primary basically because they're reinforcing to anyone. We don't have to train them. Um, pretty much any child out there likes access to video games, or they like the chance to stay up later, or um, they like the food, water are some real basic level ones. For somebody who's hungry, they're going to want food. Now, some kids with ADHD aren't always aware of their, their need for that. Um, or somebody who's thirsty wants water. And then secondary reinforcers is more things that through experience um, become associated with something positive. So um, for those of you who have a reward system in place at home, getting points or getting tokens becomes a secondary reinforcer and buys you extra time because then you trade them in later for the primary reinforcers. But, it, but it, those tokens, same way our money, really, our money has no value except the value as a society we've given to it. So now it has value because it buys things within society. Similar to grades, they have value because we as a society have given them that. So, so what we want to do with a token economy system is, is associate for a child, this is what I want you to work on, and this is what's going to happen if you work on it. Um, and I have an example here of um, one way you might do that socially. So when you're working with a token economy system and we're using it more for things related to school, things related to home, we're talking about usually a system that's happening on an ongoing basis. When we're working with social interactions, that can be the case. If you have the chance to have a neighbor kid, child who's over all the time, or to have siblings that they can work with, or in your interaction, to have things that you want them to work on, you can have something going on an ongoing basis. The, uh, but the other thing that often happens is it's more, we want them to be successful when they're with other kids. So during baseball practice, this is what I want you to work on. Or when you have a friend over, this is what I want you to work on. Or when you are at cheerleading practice, this is what I want you to work on. Um, and then these are just some examples of some behaviors. Also showing that what you can do is you can say it's all or nothing. Um, you, can, you can give them credit per time. 
Um, or you can say, um, I'm, I'm going to rate how often this happened. Did you do it most of the time, just some of the time, most of the time, or almost always? Um, so that we get a, a sense of movement there. And how this would work with a, with a play date, with what we call a structured play date, is you would set this up with your child ahead of time. So Tommy's going to come over this afternoon, um, and this is what I want you to work on. Um, for an older child, we can use the same things, but we want to be careful we're not doing it in a way that seems childish. So the same principle is there, but it looks different. Um, so um, what we want to do is, what are you going to work on when they're here? And if I hear you doing it, then that means that afterwards, this can happen. Um, and so if you get a certain number of points after they leave, we can go to Rita's, or we can, we can go at the end of the play date to Rita's, although we want to be careful not to have it seem like they lost something for a friend. Um, adding something in can be positive. Um, so the question is, what does a structured play date look like for a middle schooler? So um, it, it's less less set up in advance because what you don't want to do is turn them off before it even starts. Um, but what it may be is more informally, this is something I'm looking for you to do. So I'm looking for you, a common middle school thing might be to use active listening when your friend talks. Um, so I'm looking for you to restate and use active listening when your friend's over here. And whenever I hear you do that, I'm going to, I mean, and maybe it's, I'm going to text you a point. <laughs> because that's something that I can do on your phone, and you can know I got it. And if you check your phone, your friend won't know that. And if, you get a if I text you a certain number of points by the end, I'll take you and your friend, and we'll go here. We'll go get your nails done. Or, I mean, it doesn't have to be something that costs money. But, so it's, it's that same principle, but more developmentally appropriate. Um, even when I, and this works even for older. I mean, we can use it for ourselves. It works wonderfully to shape teachers' behavior. Um, but it also, high schoolers, college students, when I'm working with them, the, the bigger challenge as they get older is as you have less and less say, it's figuring out what is it they want. Um, for high schoolers, a lot of times what they want is, I don't want mom or dad to be in my business. So if I see that you've turned in all your homework for a day, the next night, I'm not going to ask you whether you did your homework. Um, and then the day after that, I'll check it again. Socially, it might be um, if I see that you are using active listening and letting your friend choose the activity, I'll leave you guys alone. Um, and I, I won't be involved. I prefer to add something positive and not just I won't be involved, but it can be hard with high schoolers to come up with something else. It might, but one option once they get old enough to drive, which is a whole other issue. Um, I know a lot of parents are concerned about getting to the driving stage. It might be then you can have the car and go, with, go here at the end or something like that. Because I can trust you to be responsible with the car. I can trust you to go walk to this park by yourself because you were responsible to do what I asked you to do early on. So the other consequence-based intervention um, is the one that decreases undesired behavior. And this is a punishment intervention. I want to talk about this. Um, mainly because it's overused. Um, it is the intervention that those of us who interact with kids with ADHD fall back on. And when I say it's what we fall back on, even correcting what they do is considered a consequence. So if a child with ADHD is not letting their friend choose what to do, or is talking and not listening, um, many, most of us, in that interaction would have it, find it very difficult not to go in the interaction and say, stop, wait, listen, let them have a turn, um, or not intervene in a corrective fashion. But that, that intervention that we're doing right there, um, even though that's commonly what we as parents do in social interactions, is actually a punishment. The problem with it is twofold. One is it doesn't increase kids' self-confidence. It makes them less confident socially. Um, and then the other thing is punishment interactions stop behavior. They don't increase behavior. So what you can end up having is a child with ADHD who just sort of closes in um, socially and doesn't try to say anything because they, they don't know what to say. They know what they're not supposed to say. Um, so that's, that's where it's really important for us to be careful with that. And in fact, one study that looked at parent responses to kids found that the more parents pointed out what a child did wrong, the worse their child did socially. Um, so that common teaching response of those of us as parents to want to correct 
unfortunately doesn't work that way. Um, that was a big take home message to me when I read that study. Um, instead, what we want to do is go back to the former. What are they doing right? And how do we reinforce that? So questions about that? So as I mentioned already, the problem with correction and social interactions is it doesn't help tell your child what he or she, um, it doesn't teach a new behavior. So if, this is also not during but after the interaction. If what we do is say, OK, let's go over what happened and let's talk about what didn't go well. Um, the problem is it doesn't teach the new behavior. It doesn't teach them what to do. Um, Kids will get stuck, even if you go on to try to teach them, they'll get stuck on that, I did something wrong. Um, and they can't at that moment go to fix it. And then it makes them feel bad and less confident. And unfortunately, lack of confidence in social interactions that makes all of us less skilled socially. It's really hard when we have to be searching for that time for them to do it right. And, and if we're not pointing out what they're doing wrong, we still might need to go back and do that teaching. So maybe they don't know about turn taking or active listening. I don't want to point out that they didn't take turns or they didn't actively listen. But at a calm moment unrelated to that, I might say, hey, let's work on some friendship things. And um, let's do some role plays here. And I want to teach you about, as you get older, some of the ways people interact so that you can actually bring that teaching in, not in a critical way, but at, a, at an emotionally neutral time, and then reinforce them doing it. So the question is, how do we get the school on board with this idea of really focusing on the positive and not being as much on a punishment-based intervention? Um, one of the big first things is, is um, making the school aware that your child has ADHD, that this is something that's difficult for them. Um, the nature of just life in general pulls all of us toward noticing those things that go wrong because we're busy doing everything else and that's why we don't always notice the positive. This is all the more the case in school settings because teachers have so many kids. Um, so the tendency is to notice the child who's misbehaving or the child who's not doing well and particularly socially because schools are very focused academically and getting schools on board with social goals is a challenge, um, but it's a very important thing to do. Um, more and more schools are aware of that, and they're aware that social um, interactions do affect learning, particularly through group projects and stuff. Um, how do we get the school on board? I mean, we want to make them aware of it. Definitely, if you're at a public school, you want to get a 504 plan or an IEP, where one of the first things on there is the child should be praised um, for any attempt to do good, that's always a key intervention that I put in there on any um, intervention plan. And whenever I do talks with teachers, it's my take home message for teachers. And if I get, and when I've gotten messages from teachers afterwards saying the one thing I'm doing differently is praising like crazy, um, the kids in my class, I know I've been successful. Um, it's a really hard message um, though. And, and in general, the same strategies that we would use with our kids work with teachers. So aside from those formal things, noticing when they gave you a positive and praising them for that. You know, it, it, he really responded well or she really responded well when you told me what she did well today. Um, I, I really appreciate you doing that. They're going to be more likely to come back and tell you what they did well. Um, so, so bringing that up is something that's needed, mentioning that that works at home, that you recognize how hard it is, um, and then reinforcing when they do it. So take home points. Um, when we're trying to teach new social skills, we want to practice ahead of time. We want to set them up for success. So make sure they know what it is you want them to work on. So if you're watching a child to use active listening, you want to make sure that when, you're, when your child is going into that social interaction, you and they both know what it means if they've used active listening. Because the worst thing is you don't want them to get to the end and go, oh, I was active listening. And you're going, no, you weren't. Um, so you want to make sure you're both on the same page, that you've trained them to know what they need to do, and that you both know what it is. And then you set up ahead of time. So when we get together and do this, this also works for events that can be difficult, like family reunions and stuff that have a social aspect to them. So this is the expectation. This is what I'm looking for. The, how am I going to let you know when you're doing good? And then what are, what's going to happen afterward if you're successful? And then we want to make sure we apply it in real world settings as much as possible and that we focus on teaching them what we want them to do as opposed to what we want them to stop doing. Um, and in order to do that, we want to really focus on how do we change their behavior day to day. We want to change their behavior at recess. We want to change their behavior for the play date. We don't care as much 
about we, whether we change the theory of what they're doing. And then correction, we use it sparingly, if at all. So another really important piece when we're intervening socially is friendships. Um, thankfully, um, for kids, it doesn't matter so much whether you're accepted by the whole group. And I say thankfully because it can be really hard, whether you have ADHD or not, to navigate the larger social group. What matters for how you do long term is whether or not you have a good friend. Um, I like to say whether or not you have two or three good friends because these days families move. And I've had, been through with too many kids that tragedy of I had a best friend, it was working really well, and they moved. Um, so it, it definitely is safer to set up a couple friends, although there's stages of friendship where that's really hard to do. Having a close friend is a better predictor of later functioning than overall acceptance. So it doesn't matter as much if everybody likes you, even if you're rejected. If you have a good friend who's going to lead you in good directions and going to support you, it's going to help you do better later on. Um, and, and having a, a close friend also helps if you're victimized. It helps with peer bullying that we'll talk about later. The problem is friendships are also difficult for kids with ADHD. And we want to think about how do we help that? How do we help our children form friendships and a key piece of it, how do we help them form friendships with a positive peer? Not all friendships are good. Um, a friendship with a child um, who's going to teach them bad habits and lead them in directions that we don't want them to go, just like it's true for any teenager, um, true for any child, we don't want to encourage that. Um, the good news is ADHD, ADHD friendships are no, are function just as well as ADHD, non-ADHD friendships. So there's no reason to steer your child away from other kids with ADHD, um, which I know is often reassuring for parents because you, you have that conflict of, why wouldn't want other people steering their child away from my child? The issue is more, is that child going to lead to um, Mis disobeying rules, maybe potentially later getting into deviant behaviors. So working with some of the other behaviors you wouldn't want them to do, bullying, um, either physically or with girls, social aggression and excluding. So when we're looking at forming friendship, we first need to think about how friendships form for kids. Um, so the, the friendship framework gives us four levels of friendship. Um, what happens at each of those levels is really important for how we want to help our child there. So at the first level, when kids are young, so for the kids here, parents here who have kids in kindergarten, first grade, there, friendship is just about who I play with most. Um, so my friend is the person who likes um, Dora like I do. And my friend is the person who lives next door. My friend is the one um, that lets me share with her or saves me a seat. It's friendship is based on what the other person can do for you. So at that point, what we really want to do is focus on teaching our kids those basic play skills. How do you sit and interact and play and have fun with other kids? How do you share your toy? How do you not grab toys from other children? How do you ask before you take a toy to word it positively? Um, how do you um, talk about things that it, in a way that a child does. How do you ask a child to play? So teaching them those basic, um, simple level skills. At that level, many kids with ADHD, where predominantly it's inattention that's the issue, they do pretty good. It's, it's more when kids are more hyperactive and impulsive that they may have difficulty here because of grabbing toys or um, just being active and running into other kids. But even there, at this level, many kids are very forgiving. Um, and often, kids will do OK here. Where it starts to get um, more difficult is, is as we start to move up through the age ranges. So when we get to level one, this is basically kindergarten through fourth grade. So the first thing I want you to notice is these levels have a pretty wide range and a lot of overlap. So even for kids who don't have ADHD, Kids aren't moving at a specific age, and there's a lot of variety in what kids do. At this point, though, kids are getting into more what we call cooperative play instead of parallel play. It's not just I'm playing the same thing next to somebody, but instead it, it's, it's our, do we have compatible goals? So for some kids, they like to share with other kids, or they like to suggest what to do, or they like to 
um, save a seat for somebody. For other kids, they like to be the one the seat saved for, or they like to have somebody have interesting ideas to play, or they like to be given the candy. Um, a friendship is formed when a child who likes to give meets a child who likes to receive, um, or when a child who likes to direct the activity has a child who likes, loves to have a creative peer who does that. So at that stage, we're looking at those dyadic friendship skills, but we're also looking at how can we help them find a compatible friend. So if we notice our child naturally tends to be a leader, how do we help them find some, some people who actually like to follow as opposed to who will fight them for leadership um, at, at that stage. So then we get into level two. So this is where um, kids start to get into a stronger sense of friendship and it's all about justice. Um, it's children actually for the first time can start thinking about the other person's point of view and, and they expect that, kid, that um, kids will be nice to each other. So if I share with you today, you're going to share with me tomorrow. Um, that's something that can be hard with kids for ADHD because you have to first of all remember that yesterday they shared with you and that you owe them or think ahead of time, okay, I'm going to put off taking that and share with you today so that you share with me tomorrow. It's that delay of gratification that's hard for kids with ADHD and that remembering of what's happening. In this case, but it, the encouraging thing is at this age, children choose friends who they think are like them. Um, and friendships tend to develop in pairs and be very possessive. So if what you can do is help your child find friends who have something in common, maybe they all love to draw, or they all love to play soccer, or they they both love to do this, connecting kids around something that they like um, and then will help form that friendship um, and, and start to help them be identified as the best friend of this person. The positive side of this thing is once a child has identified somebody as a best friend, they're pretty possessive of it, so it's a little more long lasting. Um, than the earlier stages. And then we also want to, the teaching at that stage is what, teaching them about just, justice. Teaching them about, well, if they shared with you today, you need to share tomorrow. Or if um, they got to go first today, you need to go first tomorrow. So the question was, what level one being the transition to cooperative play, what, um, what's the situation here for level two? So it's continuing to be cooperative, but it's a give and take. It's a back and forth. But as it says in the title there, it's fair weather cooperation. They haven't learned to handle negative um, things happening yet. So then um, as they get into, for some children it's, it's mid-elementary school, but for others it doesn't come till high school. Um, more the level three, which is when they start to have more intimate relationships. Um, in this case, that's when they start to identify a friendship almost as a new entity. So we're friends and therefore we have this goal. We're working on this. Um, and, and they start to learn about compromise. So that's one of the things you want to teach your child at that age. How do you not just take turns and cooperate, but how do you compromise? How do you find a solution in the middle between there? That's a more complicated um, social interaction. And, and it's starting to have your friends, have your kids be aware of it feels good to make somebody else happy, even if it doesn't affect me directly. Um, this is the stage kids are at when they often come in, and I have a prize box when kids come into to session, and they'll say, oh, can I get a blue ball for uh, my sister or for my best friend? They're starting to think about, because she likes blue, um, so I'm thinking about what she likes that's different from me and doing something just to make them happy. Um, so helping your child identify that as positive and, and that's a great behavior to reinforce there within the token system we talked about earlier. So thinking of what somebody else likes and doing it even when it doesn't have a direct connection to you. And then adolescence. So age 12 on, I'm, I'm sure we can all think of adults who have never really mastered this, um, but, but we start moving that in adolescence and that is mature friendships. So that's where we start, stop thinking so much just about the external benefits of friendship and starts to be more about emotional well-being, sharing, shared identity. Um, this is an important piece where in high school it's really important to keep kids involved in extracurriculars. Um, and, and, that's, and that's a tough thing to do sometimes, to navigate the demands of homework and this and that, but keeping them involved so they have that sense of belonging 
is really important. At this stage, kids can also start to have more than one friend. So I said earlier, I like to keep them having multiple friends, but it's really hard at earlier stages because kids will tend to be pretty possessive of their friendships. Um, and often, if you want to have multiple friends, it's like you have a neighborhood friend and a class friend and a soccer friend. So you have friends in different settings, but, but the friendship is really exclusive to that setting. So that's when we start thinking of these more complex things and teaching um, our teenagers about that, the active listening skills, social comprehension. So how do I understand that social situation? What was happening there? Um, it's a great chance to watch movies together or read stories together and help talk about sort of what was happening socially as a learning opportunity. Um, social problem solving. So when we have a conflict, how, how do I help resolve that? Um, and then resolving um, conflicts. When we think about the five-stage model of friendship, so that's thinking about the, the stages that these researchers, um, Levenger and um, colleagues, would say all friendships go through. Um, as you can see, it starts with sort of the superficial attraction. What, what are we interested in? Finding a place of common interest. Um, that's where we've got to get our kids with ADHD out doing things they're interested in. And sometimes that takes a whole lot of effort because even some kids with ADHD aren't even as aware of their interests, but sometimes it's not that they're not aware, but they're just not as good at planning ahead and thinking of it. So they might Friday night say, oh, I want to go out with friends, but then they're frantically calling around to see who's available that night because they haven't planned ahead. Um, so thinking through how can we get them to do those initial stages of meeting other kids like them and other kids that enjoy what they enjoy to make that process easier for them and not seem too desperate because they ask last minute. So how can we encourage them to start sooner? And then they start discovering common ground. Often that happens. It's one of the great things from extracurriculars is you can find common ground that way. Um, but it may be in other ways. And, and then as they find that common ground and they share, they start to invest in the relationship. And that's a mature friendship. The natural progression of friendship, if we don't maintain it and keep it going positive, then happens, something happens, and then the relationship begins to deteriorate, and then it breaks apart. And so what we want to help teenagers do is handle those conflicts in a way that doesn't lead to the last two stages, that doesn't lead to deterioration and falling apart. So maybe they've learned to the first pieces, but when they're emotionally worked up, that's when kids with ADHD have greater difficulty logically thinking, and they might jump to impulsively sending a text message or right, posting on someone's Facebook page, something that's very hurtful and makes a friendship go more negative. We want to help them before they get to that stage. Um, think about how, how can you, you know, she did something that was hurtful today, but maybe she didn't mean it. How, what, what's she been like as a friend? This is someone who's always been nice to you. How might she have met it? What meant it? What could you do? So help them think through what they can do in that situation. So friendships, take home points. So we use all the strategies we use to reinforce social skills, but we're focusing on an individual child. Um, friendships tend to form around similar interests. So really getting your child out there, interacting with other kids with similar interests is really important. Um, I know this can be really hard. I'm going to come to that later. Um, one thing absolutely you might need to do for that is get some modifications on homework. There, there's more and more evidence that homework doesn't particularly help learning as much as um, we might think, and certainly hours of homework doesn't particularly help learning, because by that point, if it's just you getting through it, it's critically important for your child's well-being that they form these friendships and they do well socially. It, it predicts how they do better than core symptoms of ADHD in the future. So this is a really important point to stay in touch with. And then think of the skills that need to be taught and think of those stages of friendship, which I have just reiterated here. Um, at, at each level, what is it you want to teach your child? So it's not just about what you see them doing, but it's about what other kids are doing at that level and what they should learn at that stage in friendship. Which gets us to then, what can we do? How important you guys are, how important teachers are. Um, I know in friendships, as adults, we can often feel very unimportant, even for preschoolers sometimes. You know, when they're running after that child that they want to play with, it can feel like mom, mom or dad are left behind, certainly till you get to middle school or high school. It, it can feel that way. Um, the, the thing is, um, research tells us that parents are actually quite important. 
It's a couple key things to think about. One is think about yourself. One of the things we find research-wise is that parents having friends predicts their kids having friends. Um, and we can think about this in a practical way. Sometimes it's you have a friend and they have a child and so those kids get together and that practically just helps your child have a friend and have that friendship be maintained. Part of it is you as a parent modeling friendship, modeling taking time for that. Um, so, and, and the thing is, not only is that important, it's even more important. So that relationship is true for all kids, but when we measured, checked it, when a researcher checked it with kids with ADHD um, and kids without ADHD, it was even more important for kids with ADHD. Um, I know it can be really hard as parents to take time for yourself. I, I realize that. Um, and um, I'm happy to talk about some of that later of how practically you can do it amid the demands of life, um, amid trying to get them through homework, trying to get them ready for school, and now I've added get them plan play dates, and now I'm saying take care of yourself. But um, it is critically important. It is not selfish. It does help your child. Um, so keeping your own friendships. And then prioritize planning play dates. Um, kids with ADHD just have fewer play dates than kids without ADHD, and we can come up with lots of reasons why. You know, a big piece of it is probably just how much time is spent on homework and getting them through the day so you don't have time for a play date in an evening. Um, but then if you add to it, they do have, if they have are having difficulty socially, the effort that goes into supervising a play date and planning it for them to be successful, um, that's part of it. And then their difficulty with executive function and planning ahead can just make it harder to plan it. So as I was saying, just prioritizing planning play dates, just increasing the number of play dates, even if you don't do any of the other stuff we talked about tonight as far as helping them be successful, training them to do better, just getting them to better, together with kids more helps them do better. Um, because we all get better at what we practice. And if I'm not around other kids, I'm not practicing interacting with other kids. A lot of kids have a lot of practice interacting with adults, um, but not as much practice interacting with other kids. Um, and I, as I mentioned before, this may mean more, and I'm, I'm not against homework, I'm not saying don't do homework, but definitely it may mean more to their long-term well-being than hours of homework in an evening. So talking with schools about that. How can you help them form friendships? These are, we've talked about some of these as we've talked about friendships, but this is reviewing this. So using active listening. So when your child's talking about their friends, you can model using active listening instead of jumping into teacher mode. Um, just saying, oh, so I hear that you really liked what so-and-so said today. Uh, you want to think about what we want to do is pay more attention to what they did well than to what they didn't do well. So maybe against some of our instincts, we don't want to zero in on that part that sounds like it didn't do well, but we want to zero in on the part that sounds like it did do well and where they had fun and it sounds like everybody was um, sharing and cooperating and that was fun and helping them identify what worked well. Um, when catching those moments that they did something well and giving them what we call specific labeled praise. So not just saying you did great there because they might not know what you're talking about. But I really liked that when she told you about that you listened and you told her what she was saying because that really let her know you were hearing and I could tell that meant a lot to her. What you've done there is built your child up and at the same time helped them know what is isn't supposed to do. Or I really liked that when Joey wanted to stop playing the computer and start playing ball, that you turned the computer off and got the ball and went outside and played. And I know Joey really enjoyed playing with you when you did that. And then when we need to be constructive and we need to teach, instead of go back and say what went wrong, focus that on teaching for the next time. So when we see those repeated patterns, that's time to teach a skill. So that's time not to say you're doing this wrong, but that's time to say, let's practice learning about active listening. Um, that's something people do as they get older. That's a good friend skill. Or let's practice learning about taking turns. Let's practice learning about um, the talking baton, <laughs> um, which is one way we can concretely try to let kids know about turn taking and talking, that whoever has the ball, whoever has the stick can talk, and we pass it back and forth teaching kids those, those play skills. So not just assuming kids are going to pick it up. Just like we might need to take more effort to teach them their times tables and they don't just absorb it or to teach them organizational skills or to teach them how to dress themselves in the morning. Things that many kids seem to just pick up naturally. 
these more complex interactions for kids with ADHD, we want to make sure that we set them up for success by teaching them those. So when we see, if they pick it up naturally, we don't need to teach them. But where we see them having difficulty, instead of correcting them, teach them. And, and of course, helping them choose the right peer. Not all friends are, are good friends, picking the one that's a good influence. And then planning play dates to minimize boredom and conflict. We talked about this one earlier. So setting them up for success that um, if we think that there's a favorite toy that a child has a great difficulty sharing, that toy should be put away for the play date. Because if they're going to have difficulty with somebody else playing with it, let's just have it hide <laughs> for the play date. Um, if we're going to plan an activity, let it be an activity where your child for a child who's super competitive, we want it to be more going to a playground than something where they are competing against each other and bowling or something because then we're setting them up to feel like either a failure because they lost and be a poor sport. Um, so we're not, we're not setting them up for success. So, so looking at what their strengths are and setting them up for success. For those of you who have more than one child, um, I know it's an extra challenge um, thinking through um, navigating things and siblings, that would be a whole nother conversation. Siblings are very neglected um, in, in talking about things. The sibling relationship is affected by ADHD. Um, what the sibling relationship does give us though is a chance for kids to practice social skills. So um, there's a built-in chance right there to get them to practice some of these things. It does not mean necessarily they're going to generalize to with peers more likely they might not generalize from with peers to your sibling because that tends to be where kids have the greatest difficulty. But, but reinforcing kids as they practice turn taking, um, accepting um, that somebody else has a difference of opinion or doesn't want to play with you calmly. Um, those, those kind of skills can be practiced with siblings. With the caveat that it's not, it's, you, it's not a substitute, just like practicing them with yourself, like we talked about a bit earlier. It's not a substitute for them then going out to somebody they feel less comfortable with and having them do it. Um, teachers play a key role, too. Um, one big thing is they're the ones who are there as our kids are interacting socially at school. And particularly as kids get older, school is increasingly about social interactions. Um, and so much of social interactions occurs um, on the hallways in high school and sometimes even in downtimes in class. Um, and so what we want teachers to do is to pay attention to that social piece of it. So again, catch them being good. Notice when they're doing something successful and at, when they're having difficulty intervening to provide guidance, not criticism, but guidance. You two look like you're having difficulty. Let's come over here and let's talk about it rather than letting them do that. Um, an important piece here, a recent research study found that if a teacher for one minute a day talked, had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a child with ADHD, just one minute, about something that child liked and was good at, um, and so modeled liking that child. They just went up and said, hey, I saw you playing soccer the other night. I know you're really good at it. Um, modeled being positive, just doing that when that was added to the same interventions, all these other things that we ask them to do, like reinforce things and all, kids liked that child more. So getting a teacher to like your child, um, finding a teacher who will like your child, avoiding those teachers who don't like kids with ADHD, sometimes get, getting your child in with the, the best teacher, somebody who doesn't get annoyed um, by activity and motion and really gets the need to be positive is the best intervention you can do for your child. And we're at the time of year where that's really important. Um, it also affects things socially. So it's not just academics where that affects it because what that study shows us is kids are affected by how a, a teacher talks to a child. And if a teacher is annoyed by a child, we haven't looked at that research-wise, but the implication would be that that might not have positive effects. Um, certainly, talking positive has positive effects. Um, and then the, the generalization piece. So we talked about skills deficits versus implementation deficits. Um, getting them to sh use what you're practicing in play dates and all in the school setting. Teachers can help with that through a homeschool note. Um, so here's an example of a way to do that. Um, basically, what we're asking a teacher to do is pay attention to some social goals. Um, Usually we try to get a homeschool note or a daily report card in children's 504 plans and IEPs 
Um, teachers are usually most willing to put academic goals in there, but I have definitely found teachers, especially where a child's struggling socially, to be willing to put social goals in. Um, a big challenge can be, though, that most of social interaction tends to happen where the classroom teacher is not. Lunchtime, recess, the hallway. Um, so even better if there's a, if there's a research aid, research, recess aide or a cafeteria aide or something who would be willing to complete something like this in one of those unstructured settings that are hard. Um, that's really hard to do, though, because that schools don't tend to be staffed um, to help, and particularly with current finances and schools trying to do more with less. Um, but, but if you are able to get somebody at school to report on how your child's doing socially and just give you that report back so then you can reinforce it at home. So the goal is it really is a matter of a couple minutes. It's hard to get to high school teachers to do it. I've definitely, elementary school teachers will usually do it. I've had middle school teachers be willing to do it. It's a little harder of a sell job. Um, but high school can be really hard to get them to do it. But there maybe then you think about a coach or somebody who's invested in having the child be a team player um, and suggests that that coach reports back on how they're doing. And again, you'll notice this is a common theme when we're talking about the behavior, what do we want them to do as opposed to what do we not want them to do. So a child maybe who is yelling, swearing, doing something negative, use kind words when talking with peers. Um, or a child even who's just teasing and ridiculing using kind words. Um, a child who's having difficulties with aggression or a child who's like just in other people's space, keeping hands and feet and other body parts to themselves. Um, and then you can see in that example what we're asking the teacher to rate is, is it sometimes, most of the time, almost always, um, that, that three rating is often good just because we don't want to have it be all or nothing. Um, unless a child is successful and this is something that happens at most once a day, then all or nothing is fine. But many of these behaviors happen many times a day. And we don't want a child, if, you know, a child who, um, in one example, a teacher said that this child was aggressive 56 times a day. If we had said the child had to not be aggressive at all, he would give up in the first five minutes of the day. Now, I guarantee you if a teacher's saying a child's aggressive 56 times a day, they're counting as aggression things that I would not count as aggression, poking a child, being in their space. Um, regardless, though, the teacher's doing the reporting, and so we need to set a goal that the teacher can consistently report on, and then we as parents can decide what's success. So for a teacher like that, a one might be success. <laughs> um, or getting past that one to a two might, have, might be an awesome day. And, and we can tell our, we can define that for our kids by letting them know that, that we know you're working hard to get there. So how do we get teachers to do this? This was the question that came up earlier. And, and, and basically, the better we can build a relationship with the teacher, the more likely the teacher is going to go above and beyond for our child. So having um, accommodation plans in is really important. It's great. It protects them legally. But ultimately, it's what we need to do is, is connect with that child's teacher. And that's incredibly hard when you feel, and for kids with ADHD, there's much more likely to be conflict between parents and teachers because there's just more stress. And so when you're struggling with the relationship with your child's teacher, it's incredibly hard to be positive. Um, however, the more we can affirm what they're doing right, what they're willing to do, affirm their demands, the more they're going to be willing to do for our child. Um, and, and then work with them to develop a plan, identify the problems, where does it happen. Um, and the idea here is try to move things more proactive. So instead of them giving you the phone call when there's problems, thinking ahead of time, OK, so when do these come up? How can we plan ahead for it? Um, and then if we can get them to do a homeschool note, you provide the home, um, you provide the home rewards for it. It makes a big difference for teachers to know that parents are on board. Um, and I know parents are on board, but if teachers don't see it, it can be hard. So just getting a chance to do that. Um, a, a time that can really be very helpful as a parent is the week before school starts. Teachers are grumpy about coming back to the start of school. They, they, are, they don't like that summer ended. They're setting up their classrooms. They're in there working. Taking time that week to stop by and say, is there any way I can help? Or here, I just got some, brought some cookies for you. Or, you know, I, can I help put up a, a um, bulletin board or make some copies for you? Some, the smallest thing 
can mean a lot. And what that does is have your first introduction to that teacher be positive. And it seems completely unrelated to your child, but it, it will pay off. Um, we use similar strategies when we try to get teachers engaged in research, too. So, um, trying to let them know we're positive, we're here to help you. Um, it makes it easier for, for people to want to join in um, and want to be a part of it. So take home points. Even if it seems like you don't matter, um, when your teenager is saying, get out of my social interactions, or your middle schooler, or even elementary school kids, you really do matter. And even something as um, side as your own friendships matter. Taking care of your own friendships, doing that, and then helping your child find friends. For kids who are really having difficulty, you maybe even, even need to be more actively involved. And this often is a case even particularly if kids move or they're having to navigate a new social setting, that it may be that what you need to do is determine you're going to be the best friend of a couple parents on their basketball team or the best friend of a couple classmates at school. Um, and teachers often will um, be willing, they can't give somebody else's information up, but they'll be willing to give your information to another parent. Um, if you say, you know, I'm really interested in forming friendships, because what can happen is some kids just aren't, and, and if, if your child's sitting back and being more inattentive and not speaking up, and there are other kids in class who are doing that, they're not necessarily planning play dates and all, and they may need some adults to be involved and plan that to happen. Um, just increase the number of play dates. Um, just contact with kids um, is really important, in particular contact with kids who can be friends. So not just with strangers, that's important for learning to navigate that stranger, that, that new social situation, but with kids who can be friends. Um, and then teaching your kids those skills that they need at that stage. And, but then once they learn the skills, that's not enough. We need to reinforce their practice of it. So through some kind of rewards program at home, through a homeschool note, a token economy system. Um, and then getting the teacher to cooperate. So a little positive talk um, from the teacher goes a long way with peers, that particularly in elementary and middle school, but even in high school. Um, kids will take their, their um, tone a lot from the teacher. So the last thing I want to talk about tonight is what can we do when kids get bullied? So what about when peer interactions really don't go well? Um, I know we have just a couple minutes here, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but I have a whole packet of anti-bullying and bullying intervention um, put out by the um, Philadelphia um, Coalition Against Violence. Um, and, and they actively have um, strategies set up for bullying. The biggest message is, what do you do for bullying? You get the school to set up an anti-bullying program. It, it's not an individual thing. We don't need a lot of time to talk about it, because there's not a lot you can do for an individual child. What, what works best for bullying is, is having a school-wide program. So before we get there, though, let's think about what is bullying. So bullying is an intentional aggressive act directed at another peer or over the internet where there's a power imbalance. A lot of schools these days will have an anti-bullying program. They have varying degrees of how successful they are. But as a result, they'll have a zero tolerance policy for bullying. So as a result, this, has, this bullying definition may be applied much more broadly. And it may even, you know, I've had kids be accused of bullying when they just say, I'm going to kill you as they're running after somebody in the playground because schools are having a zero tolerance policy. And that's a good thing. It helps move that line um, so kids are less likely to be bullied. But, but I wouldn't take as seriously if your child's accused of bullying for doing something like that than if your child is picking on someone where there's, there's a power differential, where they're ganging up. Um, and when, when there's bullying, there's four different roles. Um, we often think of the two, the bully and the victim. But there's two bystander roles. There's the passive bystanders um, who just stand there quietly, hope not to be noticed because they don't want to be the one who's bullied next. Um, and that actually can be seen as sort of permission to bully. Um, and then there's the active bystander, so who actively engages in the bullying and joins in um, in order to do it maybe by laughing, um, maybe by, by assisting in another way. So what do we want to do when we talk with schools? Um, even if they have an anti-bullying program in place, you want to make sure that there's sufficient structure and supervision at lunch and recess. Invariably, when bullying happens, kids say it happens in the hallway, it happens at lunch, it happens at recess. The other time is it happens in the locker um, when we're changing for gym class. So those times that are less structured, we need, if a child is saying bullying's happening, one thing I've learned over the years, it's the tip of the iceberg. We need to take them seriously. 
They may seem like they're overreacting and being overstrong, and that's usually because there's a lot more underlying it. And so till they get to the place of saying it, that emotion is out of, is extreme because there, there's a lot more underlying it. That being said, some children are very dramatic. Nonetheless, if they're saying they're being bullied and they're saying it's happening in these unstructured things, it's probably happening. Um, and um, then we need to, and then what we really want to do is create a school climate where bullying's not valued and help work with our kids to help them to be a leader, to help them stand up against other kids who are being bullied. If your child happens to be the one being the bully, sometimes kids with ADHD will fall into that role. Um, sometimes because they, they do struggle with oppositionality, um, they haven't learned a way to engage positively. Um, so they may have comorbid oppositional defiant disorder and struggle with that. Um, and, and they may struggle with it. But sometimes they may fall into being bullied just because they're trying to join. And, and they're not trying to be mean, but it's happening because I'm joking and I'm, I'm doing it in a mean way or I feel rejected, so then I'm retaliating. Um, so if, if our child is being a bully, what we want to have them do is really know other ways to solve their problems. So that problem solving training that we wanted to do socially, we want to work with them on that and then really work with them on empathy and perspective taking. So how do you think the other child felt? Um, that takes a level of sitting and thinking about the other child's interaction that sometimes we have to work with kids with ADHD on. For the victims, teach them to protect themselves. Where are you likely to be bullied? How can you um, prevent yourself from being alone in that secluded part of the playground? Or um, leaving earlier or later um, when you're switching between classes so that you don't Aren't, aren't vulnerable. How, help them build a friendship. That protects against bullying. So having a friend who will stand up for you, being together, that, that protects against bullying. And then the last thing is how do you respond? Um, the um, Philadelphia Collaborative Violence Prevention Center set, talks about three different ways. You can stand tall. So you can tell them just really directly, assertively speak up against what's said. Well, why are you saying that? Why are you asking that? If a child can calmly respond to that, that can be a good way to respond. For many kids with ADHD, that's very hard. For many kids in general, that's hard, particularly for kids with ADHD. The let it slide choice, that's, that's just choosing to ignore it and walk away. Bullies are looking for a reaction, and if you just walk away, often that can get rid of it. And then what we call flipping the script or using humor. So turning it into, if they're saying, oh, you have huge feet, saying, yeah, my feet are so big that I um, wore shoes as big as my dad when I was in first grade, or turning it into a joke on yourself so that you're no longer the victim, but now everybody's laughing with you. Um, that last one is often, for kids with ADHD, the easiest response to do because they can impulsively come up with something. But for others, it, it is more walking away. Um, so just in conclusion, um, you as parents can do a lot to help your child succeed socially. Um, it's important to be actively involved. It's important to reinforce they're, not, they're using things at the place of performance um, and use things like the token economy and homeschool notes that you guys use for other goals and use them for social goals. Um, and then really helping them form a friendship to promote resilience. Just increasing contact with peers is positive. But we want to, as much as possible, set up the environment for them to be success, getting successful, getting teachers, getting coaches on board, other adults on board. And then if, if your child is being bullied, take it seriously and address it. If anyone has any questions, I'll be around afterward. But thank you for your attention.